or good morning. morning. We'll do better than that in just a minute. All right. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, that's so much better. It is good to have you here. We need all the joy we can because some people, for some reason, get a little down on a rainy day. I think it's just liquid sunshine. I think it's great. Hey, don't forget about the Bible study Wednesday at 7. Um, I think for sure we're going to wrap up 2 Timothy this time. Perfect time to start with us so we can get into a new book and really get going with it. And today, today is the last day to order your mums. Somehow, make sure that either Margaret or Joanne have your order by, by the time you leave service this morning. Okay, The continental breakfast that we used to do prior to COVID on the first Sunday of every month is going to start back up, and that'll be on the 4th of September. We uh, open the doors and invite you in. Try, try for nine, but we're always here before. And we've already got a volunteer to do that first one. Kathy Seabuck's going to do it for us. The charity circle is going to meet on the 6th at 6. And this is one of what I think is the, one of the more rewarding times of the year because you're filling out all the, you're filling the boxes for the college students and for the military people. Um, I think there's two blessings involved. Well, actually, I can think of three. One, the person that receives it. Two, the person that fills it. And the third one is the person who drops all the items in that donated box out there in the connector. They'll take them from there, fill the boxes, send it off. Everybody gets blessed. How many times do we find a way to get a win-win-win? Okay, that's one way to do it. What other announcements do we have that I might have missed? Yes, sir. Yeah, yes, sir. If you didn't attend that service, I think you missed something that was really beautiful. I've never been to a celebration of life that had a woodwind uh, orchestra. Is that what you're going to call it? A clarinet, a clarinet ensemble. I show you. I, I showed my entire music vocabulary to you right there. <laughs> so I need all the help I can get. But it was, it was unique and it was beautiful, and I think it it served a very unique and lovely man in a, in a very good way. So I, I congratulations, you did it well. Any other announcements that we have? Linda. Yes? I, I just yeah. it's great to do. And the Beamers felt the same. They came to me this morning and said, man, the cards, the prayers, the calls, they all make a huge difference. So whatever you're doing, keep it up. Send out a card a day. They're easy to do, and they, they mean so much to the people who get them. Okay. Any other announcements? Yes, sir. Board meeting next Sunday, 530. Board meeting next Sunday, 530. Okay. Anybody's welcome to attend, but board members are highly encouraged to attend. Okay. If there aren't any others, I'm going to ask for birthdays. Any birthdays this week? Hey, he's already up.
learning a few recipes. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> Any anniversaries? If you'll stand up for us, please. between the two of you, 50 for her, 50 for him, that marvelous. Okay. I heard a lot of uh, updates to the uh, prayer requests, some of the good things. I always try and mention some of the good things. Um, Ray, Kathy Seabook's brother, he's doing pretty well. As a matter of fact, she said take him off of the prayer list. Um, Charlie had a little skin cancer operation on the top of his head. Looks like it's doing well. Looks like they got it all there. Um, by the way, Greg has a lot of back pain. He's got a surgery coming up this week. And so does Sharon Cruiser. She's got a surgery coming up this week. One of the other good things I heard is Doug Wicker. He's, the address is here on the back of the bulletin. He's making progress. And progress to me is an answered prayer. I'm, they still need a lot of prayer because there's miles and miles to go, but there's progress being made. So keep the prayers up. And now if you would please join me in a moment of silent prayer and the ringing of the bell. Lord, we come before you today with all of our blessings and our prayer requests wide open to you. Our hearts are just as open as we can get them. Help us to get our hearts even more open for you. Lord, we thank you for blessings like Becky Gardner received. She went to the hospital unable to even move herself to the edge of the bed. Three days later, while they're still doing the diagnostic evaluation, she's suddenly able to walk 20 feet Honor Walker, we give you all the credit for that. We thank you for the blessings, for the miracles, for the healings that are laid at your feet. We thank you also for the nudges of your will in our lives so that we can be about sharing your existence with them all. Thank you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
praise him this morning. Please turn to page 571. This is the day. Let's stand as we sing that through twice, please. Page 571. <clears throat> Scripture reading for today comes from the book of 1 Timothy, chapter 4, verses 11 through the end of the chapter. Command and teach these things. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to to the public reading of scripture, to preaching, and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift, which was given you through a prophetic message when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. For our prayer hymn, please turn to page 530. I'd rather have Jesus. We're going to sing all three verses standing on the third, page 530. <laughs> Thank you. 
Lord, as we come here today, we come here to praise you, to acknowledge your power, your glory, your authority, your right as the creator of all of this. We come to submit ourselves to you, to acknowledge that you are the creator, we, the created, we are here to serve you. We thank you for all the blessings that you have poured out upon us. And as the hymn says, we would rather have a relationship with you than anything. We also understand that the trappings of this world sometimes appear very beautiful at the beginning. Help us to see the truth. Help us to see the eternity in the relationship with you. And help us to keep and share that joy of knowing you. In Christ's name, amen. For our communion hymn, please turn to page 28. To God be the glory. We're going to sing the, all three verses standing on the third page, 28. Precious Lord, we're so thankful to be here in your house this morning to hear your word and to share it as well. Lord, we know that uh, 
the come to hear to seek and to save, but you also left us with the promise of an eternal life. You left us with instructions to inherit that, that promise of eternal life. You also give us the option of, of forgiveness for love for everything that, that we do comes through you. And we know this message is truly, truly the way that we should live and help others to see that same message. Just now, Lord, we just ask the blessing upon this loaf that represents that body that went to the cross for our salvation and for our sins. And we just lift you up, Lord Jesus. We lift you up on high. And we pray all these things in your name, in Jesus' name. Our Heavenly Father, we continue to thank you and praise you for your plan of reconciliation, which you had from the very beginning. Because, Lord, we know that it is your desire that each and every one of your children be with you in eternity. And so just now, Lord, we stand before this table and we thank you for that plan and for the love, mercy, and grace that made it possible. We thank you, Jesus, for coming down, giving up your place on high to live amongst us, to teach us, and to take upon yourself the sins of the world. So just now, Lord, we ask for forgiveness in all the ways we've let you down throughout this week, and we ask a blessing upon this cup, for we know it reminds us of the blood that Christ shed for us at Calvary. And we ask all these things in your Son's name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we have come together today to celebrate the grace that only you can give. We know that our lives are, are your gift to us. What we do with those lives are our gift in return to you. And as we gather, we also bring a portion of our earthly blessings to further your work, and we ask your guidance in the use of those blessings. We ask this all in your Son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. I'm going to play uh, Reach Out to Jesus because he's reaching out to you.
I, I was very interested in watching you there because I didn't know if that piano could play with a shoe. You see, Tina always takes her shoes off and plays with her bare feet. So I was watching to see if you're going to take your shoe off, but, but you didn't. So it, it, it works either way. You know, when I was looking at this scripture, and I saw these words, command and teach, and it kind of threw me for a loop, because I understand teaching, but command and teach. I thought about that for a little bit, and then I started thinking, you know, if you ask my kids, I probably did command. There were times I think I probably just said, this is the way it's going to be. And, and at first I thought, well, I don't command people. And then I started thinking, wait a minute, whoa, whoa. I remember you, there was a time in which my building was torched by one of my students. I didn't say, oh, by the way, children, it might be, might be wise to leave the building. I commanded. I said, we're out of here. You move. It was February, four inches of snow on the ground, no coats, no jackets, no anything. Get out of the building. Why? Because I was commanding to save their lives. I was commanding something that was paramount in their life. When the Apostle Paul said, command and teach, he wasn't talking about commanding things that are unimportant. He was saying, this is what can save your life. We, we destroyed, by the way, two rooms, two classrooms were completely destroyed in that fire. But not one kid was hurt because we commanded, get out of the building. And there were some who said, can I get my jacket? No, no, get out of the building. You know, it's been said that it's not a dog's keen sense of smell or hearing that makes them want to be really cuddly with a human being. It's their desire to obey. It's their desire to have a relationship. And I, I remember very early in my life studying uh, the, the uh, Prussian monarch, Frederick the Great, and he said, you know, the more I see of people, the more I like my dogs. And, and it's a very good statement because, you know, I, it, most of us, if we've had a, a loving dog, if we've been good to the dog, and, and the interesting thing is sometimes dogs are good to us even when we're not good to them. A dog will sometimes be very good to an owner, and the, and the owner may not be a very good person. But that dog loves almost unconditionally and wants to obey, wants to do what's right. It wants to cuddle. It wants to be a part of your life. And the question I'm asking is, when Jesus says, command and teach, and he said it through Paul, how much do we want to obey him? Luke chapter 6, verse 46 says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? This is Jesus. He said, why in the world do you keep saying, oh, Lord, Lord, but you don't want to do what I ask you to do? He's making it very clear that we need to understand what it means in that old beautiful song, trust and obey. And sometimes we don't trust as well as we should, and sometimes we don't obey. You know, I've told you many times, I was a principal for 23 years. And I will tell you very honestly, if the superintendent called and said, come, I went. If the superintendent said something on the order of... Um, I want you to do this, I did it. Even to the point, probably if he said jump, I would have said how high. Now, I, you know, when, when I went to work at Franklin Township after all my years at Westfield, and the, the board asked me, what do you offer? And I said, I offer two things. I offer public relations, and I offer loyalty. Because loyalty is something I think is vital. I think it's important. You have to be loyal. And that loyalty comes from coaching. It comes from a lot of things. But it also comes from understanding 
that Jesus Christ is asking us to be loyal to him. Why do we ask you to do these things, he was saying, and yet you don't want to do them? You want to call me Lord, Lord, but you don't want to do what I ask you to do. Timothy said both command and teach. How many times do we tell a child, don't go into that street? That's not a request. That's a command. Why? Because you're wanting to save the child's life. Don't put your fingers in the... I said, <laughs> that happened yesterday. <laughs> yesterday. And I don't know who the little one was, but he was running and starting to put his fingers in the wall. And I forget who it was. Michael, were you... Who, some, any one of the men starts yelling at him, don't do that. You know, don't put your fingers in that little plot. Yeah. yeah. That, hey, we're not asking, we're commanding. Why? Because we know it's in the best interest of the child. It's in the best interest of the person. So if, if we're teaching and commanding the word of God, we're not doing it to harm or to hurt. We're doing it to try to save a soul, save a life. And you know, the interesting thing is, as I looked at these verses, and I, I, I just tried to process them, and I said to myself, you know, when you look at the verses that Brett read in your hearing, it's really kind of a recipe for how to live our lives to understand how to obey the word of God. And, and I started thinking about recipes, and then I was thinking yesterday about the dinner, and I know that Anytime we have a church dinner and somebody brings a new recipe in, and if all the women like it, everybody say, give me that recipe. And, and, and Richard, if I may, may I, may I use you? Thank you. I first met Richard when he felt like that maybe things were doomed. Is that fair? And then a man named Steve Norris came into his life, a very cocky, arrogant young man that I coached and yet became one of the finest doctors I know. And when he came into Richard's life, Richard's life turned around. True? Did you ever recommend to anybody else that they see Steve Norris? Yeah, see, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. That's my point, Absolutely. We do it with food and we do it with doctors. We've got to do it with the word of God. We've got to be willing to share. We're, we're very happy to share recipes. We're very happy to share our doctors, our medications. Why aren't we sharing the love of God and the glory and the joy of Jesus Christ? So this is what Paul has said in that scripture. And I just want to kind of walk it through and, and, and help you see it's a recipe for the way we live our lives. The first thing he said was, don't let anyone look down upon you. Here's his words. Command and teach these things. Don't let anyone look down on you because you're young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and purity. And I'm going to, I'm going to expand that a little bit and say, don't let anyone look down upon you, period when you're sharing the word of God. Don't let somebody look down upon you because you're young, he said. Well, everybody in the church at that day was young in Christ, but some were older in age. Timothy is one of the younger. Uh, my, my research says that Timothy became a Christian somewhere around the age of 19. And this could have been anywhere from 19 to 30 when he's writing this. But Timothy still considered a younger person. He's saying, don't let someone put you down just because you're young. Don't let someone put you down just because you're a woman. Don't let someone put you down just because you're whatever. Don't let someone put you down when you are representing Jesus Christ. You know, looking down is, is really kind of sad. I, 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 again, I thought about my own personal career and I served five different superintendents in my lifetime. And the first one was six foot ten. And he always came to talk to me here. So I'm going, hmm. 
I was a very happy sixth grade teacher. He walked up to me and said, my, my basketball coach is going to be my eighth grade, seventh grade math teacher. And I'm going, I always wanted to teach math. Yeah, very dominating, you know, very dominating personality. And his size certainly made the difference. My second superintendent was absolutely wonderful. Most down-to-earth man I ever knew. I remember I was interviewing teachers, and we were in a real old building. It's a 1906 structure with a 1956 and 36 building on either end. But it's an old, old building. And, and I'm interviewing this teacher, and I'm wanting to show her the building. And here's the superintendent, and he was dressed very casually. And I introduced him as the head custodian. And he went along with it fine. Dave just you know, handled it very beautifully. And three weeks later, when she went in to sign her contract, it blew her away that he was the superintendent. But he was that kind of guy. He was just down to earth every day. He would go along with a joke like that. My third superintendent was really also a neat, neat human being. You know, it's, it's special. When, and, you, and when you have somebody like that, you want to go the extra mile for them. You want to do the best job you can for them. My fourth superintendent got fired in a year and a half. And he was a jerk with a capital J. And unfortunately, my fifth superintendent forgot we were there for kids. He thought we were there for him instead of for the kids. So you see, it, it, it all depends on, on who it is. So my point is, when you have an opportunity to work with someone who is so loving and so down to earth, and who was more loving and down to earth than Jesus? He was just down to earth. He was every day down. You know, that's why he's saying, I am the good shepherd. He didn't say, I'm the king of kings. He was. But what did he say? I'm the good shepherd. He put himself down as a shepherd. Why? Because he wanted us to be able to work with him and understand. As, as sheep, we would respect the shepherd. We would love the shepherd. We would we respond to the shepherd just like I said dogs at the beginning respond to human beings. That's what he wanted. He wanted a relationship with us that we loved him and would follow him and care about him. That's what it's all about in our relationship. You know, I, I remember talking to a preacher friend of mine, and he overheard a couple, and a new family came in to the church, and they, they weren't dressed as well as some of the others and maybe a little stench or something, but he overheard a couple of women say, well, you know, they're just not our class of people. And it broke his heart. Of course it broke his heart. There are no classes of people when you come into the body of Christ. It doesn't matter. You know, that old proverb that, in, in Proverbs that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. You know, we're all in this together. And it doesn't make any difference how we dress or who we are. We're in this together. Don't let people look down upon you. You know, and sometimes we do. We, you know, the older you get, the more you think kids today are a little crazy. And we sometimes forget that when we were the kids, we were a little crazy. We sometimes pass off on the dumb things that we did when we were kids. Don't let anybody look down upon you because you're young in the spirit. You're young in the church. You're young in the family. Don't ever let anybody look down upon you for that, he said. And secondly, he said, spend as much time as you can with the Lord. Until I come, devote yourself to public reading of the scripture to preaching and to teaching. So he's saying, you know, if you really want the recipe of how to connect real well, first of all, don't let anybody put you down. And secondly, do as much studying as you can. Because studying makes all the difference. You know, we, I, we, we say it all the time. We have a Bible class every mo Sunday morning at 930. We have a Bible study every Wednesday night. And those are important. And I, we beg you to come because you grow. You just do. And, and it's an important part of our, of our growth is, 
and studying together. And you can tell me, okay, Larry, I can study by myself. And you can. If you're studying by yourself, I applaud you. But I will tell you, for me, studying with a group, I grow more. Because sometimes I only see things from my own perspective when I'm studying alone. But when I'm studying with a group, I get to see things from a variety of different perspectives. And it helps me grow. <laughs> Until I come, devote yourself to public reading of the scripture, to preaching and teaching. I'll never forget the first sermon I ever preached. I was 22 years old. I hadn't started college yet. Wife, two kids, third one on the way. And I remember they asked me to, to, to preach a sermon. I had no idea how to put together a sermon. I'm going to tell you, it took me about 90 minutes to go through that sermon. And when I looked at the clock, it was 12. I mean, I was perspiring. I, was, I, I told them everything I knew from Genesis to Revelation. It took me 12 minutes. So my point is, how do we develop? And, and the answer is practice, practice, practice. I bet, you, I bet you Bruce didn't practice at all for what he played tonight. He just, he just walked up there and did it. Or did he put hours of practice into it? Yeah. You don't have productivity without practice. It's just that simple. And so we have to practice our our reading, practice our scripture reading, practice our, our prayer life, practice. And that's what he's trying to tell us. And I know, I know about the rest of you, I know when I became a Christian, I've told you this many times, when I became a Christian, I felt like a moron because everybody else knew so much and I knew nothing. You know, I knew nothing and I was embarrassed. And I remember, I, you know, <laughs> we didn't have a lot of money, but I set off for correspondence courses with Johnson Bible College because I just wanted to try to catch up. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm begging you, don't feel embarrassed. We encourage you to come to Bible study. Don't feel embarrassed if you don't know what anybody else or everybody else knows. You've got to start someplace. And we encourage you to, to start with us, because we're going to be loving and caring and understanding. Yeah, until I come, devote yourself to public reading. And that's what it's all about. And then he, he goes on to say, <laughs> and I, I have to admit, I, I, I heard on the radio a preacher, his name was Dick Alexander, and he was from Spring Life Christian Church in, in Cincinnati. And he said, you know, it takes me about two years for my good sermons. And I'm looking at that and say, what? It takes you two years to your good sermons? And what he said was this. He said, every time I get a sermon idea, I make a folder. And every time I get some idea about that sermon, I put it into the folder. And it may sit there for a year or two, and I put things into it. And then when I get ready to preach that, I pull all the good stuff out, and, and that's it. So he's got all these folders. So he is preparing sermons for two years in advance all the time. You guarantee me two more years, I'll do it. <laughs> the third thing he says is, don't neglect your gift. Verse 14, do not neglect the gift which was given you through a prophetic message when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Don't neglect your gift. And I know half of you are saying, but I don't have one. And mom's saying, you all have gifts. Everyone in this room has a gift. It may not be taking your shoes off and playing the piano. It may not be having your shoes on and playing the piano. It may not be singing up here. It may not be, but you have a gift. And whatever that gift is, don't neglect it. The gift may be just a gift of smiling. It may be a gift of hugging. It may be a gift of sharing. Don't neglect the gift, he said. You know, I know that Tina and Karen and Betty come up here and, and, 
and share their gifts. But others have gifts too. They're not the only ones that could come up here as Bruce proved and share the gift. And Joe and Dolly and Denise and Audie and Mike and Mike and Dale come up here and share. But that doesn't mean it, there are so many other gifts and other just here. You, and you know something? I thought about this the other night. Here we have, we'll, we'll say we have Betty and Tina up here playing and we have Mike and Mike and, and Dolly and, and Joe and, and maybe Audie and, and Dale and, and so forth up here. But you know, without you, it's only a performance. But with you, it's a gathering. It's worship. You see, all the people up here are only performing if you're not joining in with them. It takes you. It takes your singing. It takes your smiling. It takes your praise. It takes all of that to make this family work. And so when he says, don't neglect your gift, you each have one. Peter says in chapter 4, 10, and 11, each one should use whatever gift he's received to serve others. There, there it is. Whatever it is, how are you going to serve others? That's the gift. Faithfully administrating God's grace in its various forms. Isn't that powerful? Do you, you realize that you, your gift is sharing God's grace with other people. It's magnificent. And, this, and the, the fourth thing he says is, keep on keeping on. I think I, I changed that a little bit, but he says, be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. That's keep on keeping on. That's be diligent. Don't give up. Remember that old commercial that used to, don't give up the ship. Don't give up. It is so easy to look at the television, to look at the news, and say the whole world's going to hell in a handbasket. It's easy to say that. It's harder to say we will overcome. We will not give up. We will not give in. We know where we stand. We know what we believe in. We know. And, and that's what's so important. Diligent pays off. And you can't quit. You can't give up. You can't become discouraged. And it's so easy to do. And lastly, he says, have a doctrine you believe in and stand on it. What he actually says is, watch your life and doctrine closely. Preserve in them, because if you do so, you will both save yourself and the hearers. You will save yourself and those that you're with. Doctrine. I remember in, in one of the classes that I took years and years ago that they discovered in a cellar after World War II these words. I believe in the sun even when it's not shining. I believe in love, even when I feel it not. I believe in God, even when he's silent. That's what it has to be. I have to believe. I believe in the sun. I can't see it right now, but I believe in it. I know it's there. I've told you before, I sit in my hot tub at night, and I will say, God, I know you're up there. Maybe the clouds, I can't see a star, I can't see anything. But that doesn't change anything. I know you're there. I know you're there. <laughs> There's a, an old Southern Baptist preacher. His name was Vance Harver. And he wrote a book on this rock I stand. And I've got to just share a couple of things with you. I love it. He said, on this rock I stand. I believe the Bible is the word of God. I don't understand it all, but I stand on it. Anybody here understand the whole thing? Cover to cover? Yeah. But stand on it. That's what he's saying. I stand on it. I believe it. I don't always understand it, but I believe in it, and I'm going to stand on it till the day I die. 
He says, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe that Jesus died for my sins. I believe that Jesus Christ rose boldly from the grave. That's doctrine. I believe that Jesus Christ is the answer to every problem, past, present, and future. That's powerful. And when you believe that, when you really believe that, and you stand on that, nobody can make you get off your rock. I stand on this rock, and I'm not getting off of it. I'm playing king of the hill, and you can't get me off my rock. How important it is. Sometimes, I said, we look at the TV and we think everything's going downhill. Let me remind you of something. I don't know how many of you remember your ancient history, but let's talk just for a moment about ancient history. Because an ancient history was bloody and violent and vicious. Even, you know, I loved Greek history. I loved the Trojans. Loved those Trojans. And then you start studying. Do you know that the Trojans killed every imperfect baby? If a baby was born with any kind of, imper any kind of imperfection, it was killed. Back in the ancient times, rape was normal. Not abnormal, normal. Women were just a sexual plaything or something to do chores around the house. Murder was acceptable. And what changed it all? Jesus Christ. Christianity brought morality and, and, and a work ethic into the world that had never been there before. It brought a mor morality that had never been there before. And it elevated women to a position they had never held before. So when you start thinking about things are all going downhill, understand what the love of God through Jesus Christ has done to change the world. And you and I, we are challenged to be world changers as well. Remember, he said, if you do these things, you will not only save yourself, but you will save the people who hear you, meaning watching your life and making a difference. As you know, we always offer an invitation. We never know when there might be just one person in this room who's never accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Or there might be one person watching us online. As most of you know, we appreciate our online viewers. There are far more people watching us online than there are in this room. So there may be someone in this audience or in that audience who's never accepted Jesus Christ never accepted the recipe that will make a difference in their life. So this is your opportunity to do just that. Or if you're a member of his body and want to be a part of this family, we invite you to come as well. Our hymn invitation is number 626. I love to tell the story. If you're able, we invite you to stand.
putting things back together physically. There was a lot of damage during that period of time. Some natural rot and decay, but some vandalism that took place. And, and uh, so we're, we're trying to put everything back. But I think I can tell you that all four of our schools will be open and at the 1st of September. And uh, we're completely staffed. We have some brand new people in place, uh, some energetic, enthusiastic people. Um, all of our people have gone through the training. Uh, it, 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 that's, those are all successful stories, I think. And I just want you to know that they do appreciate so much what this congregation is doing for them. They, they do think about you and pray for you often. Please join us next time.